The OSIRIS-REx spacecraft just performed its sample retrieval maneuver at asteroid Bennu, and this video will be going over a method of how to measure how much mass they were able to get from the touch-and-go maneuver. Now the animation here shows a body reference frame of a spacecraft spinning about its z-axis, and for OSIRIS-REx, they plan on measuring the amount of mass they collected by calculating the difference between how the spacecraft rotates before and after they collect the Bennu samples. So in this video, I'm going to be going over the OSIRIS-REx sample mass measurement, and it's got a lot to do with angular momentum and velocity, as well as moment of inertia. So to do this analysis, we need to come up with a simplified bus model for the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft, which I have here on the right, where we're going to assume that it's a rectangular prism with evenly distributed mass all over. So we have these dimensions, just 2.43 meters and 3.15 meters. This is just something I got from the Lockheed website, which I'll post a link in the description to. We have some sort of body fixed reference frame where we have the body X, Y, and Z. We have the tag SAM arm, which is where the Bennu sample is actually going to be held at the end of it. So tag SAM arm has some length. And then in order to be able to measure the change in inertia from the Bennu sample, we need the distance from the center of mass of the spacecraft all the way to the Bennu sample, which is given in this diagram. So we're going to also assume that their mass is at 50% because they still have to come back to Earth. Uh, this is just an assumption. I don't know if that's true, but it seems like a reasonable assumption. So we're giving a mass of about 1495 kilograms. And if we use a principal reference frame for the body frame, we can get an inertia tensor, which is centered at the origin, or it's the origin of the reference frame is at the center of mass. We can get a diagonal inertia tensor that looks like this to represent the spacecraft body. And then from the parallel axis theorem, we can get that the Bennu sample will add inertia based on this equation right here, again, from the parallel axis theorem, where the, the inertia that the sample is adding, assuming it's just a point mass, is the mass of the sample that is retrieved times r squared, where r is a distance from the center of mass of OSIRIS-REx to the Bennu sample. So now we get into how to measure the sampled mass from analyzing the spacecraft spin. Now, this is just a way to do it. I don't know if this is how they did it, but this is the way that I came up with when I was thinking about this problem. So what you want to do is to find the difference in angular velocity, which corresponds to the difference in inertia after collecting the Bennu sample mass. And we need to get a measurable value from this, which we can get from the attitude determination system, which is a star tracker that's able to determine the spacecraft attitude at any given time. So the first step would be that before you get the sample mass, you want to measure how long it takes for the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft to complete one revolution. So basically you give it some sort of angular momentum and you time how long it takes to rotate 360 degrees. So you trade a fixed angular momentum, and notice it's momentum, not velocity, because the onboard reaction wheels, what they do is a trade momentum with the bus. So if the reaction wheel starts spinning in one direction, that means the bus itself is going to spin in the other direction due to conservation of angular momentum. So you just want to find, you want to give the reaction wheel some sort of fixed angular momentum to command to the bus. And now, after you get the sample, you want to give the same amount of this angular momentum, again, not velocity, just the momentum, to the spacecraft bus after you get the sample. And then you wait one period, which the period is before the sample was collected. So how long did it take before the sample was collected to complete a 360 degree rotation? That amount of time, wait that amount of time, and then measure how many degrees were actually rotated in that period after you collected the mass, which should be less than 360 degrees because you have more inertia. So with the same angular momentum, your angular velocity should be lower. And then you can use this delta theta value, I'm calling it delta theta right here, to be able to calculate the sample mass collected. Now this diagram here shows a rotation that say before the sample was collected, you do a 360 degree rotation all the way around. And then using that same angular momentum, and after the sample is collected, you rotate around with the same angular momentum, but because you have more inertia, you don't get to 360 degrees. Now, this is exaggerated. It's a lot less than this. But it's just to illustrate that there's some sort of delta theta angle that you didn't reach because you have the sample mass on board. 
So in order to be able to figure out how this delta theta value correlates with how much sample mass was collected, we need a few equations. So first we start with the angular momentum is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular velocity in that direction. So in this case, I'm going to have the spacecraft body spinning around its z-axis, which will mean that the angular momentum in the z-axis is going to be equal to the moment of inertia in the z-axis times the angular velocity in the z-axis. Now the period of a rotation with constant angular velocity is equal to 2 pi over the angular velocity. And delta theta, which is how far the rotation has gone as far as an angle, is going to be equal if you have a constant angular velocity, it's just going to be equal to delta theta equals the constant angular velocity times the amount of time. Now this is analogous to say you're running in a straight line with a constant velocity how far you got is equal to what your constant velocity was times the amount of time that you were running. And then another thing we have to know is a degree is going to be equal to 360 arc seconds. So arc seconds are just a more precise way to measure a rotation or an angle. So basically one degree is broken up to the 360 different arc seconds. So now we get to the derivation of how to correlate the amount of rotation that was done by the spacecraft body to the amount of sample mass that was collected from Bennu. And in this derivation, I'm going to be using the convention that n, n equals no sample, and then s equals sample. So n is the spacecraft bus before you get to sample, and s is the spacecraft after you get to sample. So because I defined earlier that there's going to be some sort of constant angular momentum that's going to be given to the spacecraft by the reaction wheels. So because it's constant, it's going to be equal to the moment of inertia before you get the sample times the angular velocity. And that same constant value is the moment of inertia after you get the sample times the angular velocity after you get the sample. And then you get that the initial measurement of how long it takes a spacecraft to rotate 360 degrees, which I'm giving a period underscore n, where n is before the sample, is 2 pi over the angular velocity before the sample. And then the amount that the spacecraft rotates after getting the sample is going to be equal to the angular velocity after getting the sample times that initial period, so the period before getting the sample, basically how long it took for the spacecraft to rotate 360 degrees before it got the sample. So the first thing you want to do is you want to solve for this angular velocity after getting the sample, which is just from this equation here, just h constant over the inertia after getting the sample. And then from this, you want to plug it into the delta theta equation, where you're just plugging straight through, getting the h constant over is tn. Just plug in this value into this equation. And then after that, you want to plug in the h constant value of how it relates to the original spin. So replacing h constant here with i n omega n, just as this equation states here. And then after that, you want to go ahead and plug in, again, this Tn equals 2 pi over omega value into the equation. So just plugging in Tn here, over here. And then from this, you'll see that actually the omega n's will cancel. And this is something that I didn't anticipate before doing this analysis, is that I thought it would be dependent how far or the change in the angle would be dependent on the angular velocity, but it actually ends up canceling out. And then we know from the parallel axis theorem that the moment of inertia after getting the sample is equal to the moment of inertia before getting the sample plus the mass of the sample times how far away it is from the center of mass of the spacecraft. So then when you plug in that IS value into this equation, you go ahead and get the equation where you can get the rotation of the spacecraft after collecting the sample as a function of the amount of mass that you got from the sample. So here is a plot of that equation where the x-axis is the amount of mass collected in grams from Bennu, and then on the left is how many degrees short the spacecraft would come in the rotation from 360 degrees. So say that OSIRIS-REx collected 100 grams of Bennu sample, it would mean that the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft after doing the rotation would actually only get to 359.5 degrees of rotation. That's what this is saying. And then on the right y-axis is the exact same thing, just in arc seconds. So that's just multiplied by 3600 to show the arc seconds. So OSIRIS-REx has a 60 gram Bennu sample mission requirement. That is their goal of how much mass they want to bring back to Earth. And OSIRIS-REx has onboard star trackers for attitude determination. And this is important because 
the star trackers are what measure the attitude of the spacecraft so you can measure how far away you were or how far you rotated before and after getting the sample using star trackers and star trackers can measure attitude within roughly tens of arc seconds and that's so that's extremely precise and it's very it's really cool that they're actually able to do that with such precision and you can see that roughly tens of arc seconds is really small when you look at this scale. So basically, if the requirement here is to get 60 grams of Bennu mass, it's going to be really easy to tell using these star trackers how far you rotated to be able to tell how much mass was actually collected here because this is on the scale of 1800, so uh, over about 2000. So roughly tens of those is a very small amount compared to the whole rotation. And actually, star trackers, the accuracy of them are dependent on the angular velocity due to smear. So star trackers just take images of the stars and have an internal catalog in order to be able to say, if I see these stars in this orientation, this is the way that I must be pointing. They're actually pretty impressive and they're really cool pieces of technology. So this is how you would correlate the amount of sample mass that was collected to the amount of rotation after collecting that sample. Now, of course, I made a lot of simplifying assumptions to do this analysis, and it's a good first order analysis, but obviously when you get to real life, things are much more complex and you can do much better high fidelity simulations, which I'm sure that they did. So this is just a list of the things that would make this a lot more complex problem. So first thing is attitude perturbation torque. So when you're trying to measure angles these this small, these matter. So solar radiation pressure, so basically the solar wind coming from the sun is going to torque the spacecraft, which will give it some sort of different attitude that you didn't model for in this analysis. And then Bennu, depending how far away they are, could also do that. There's also uneven mass distribution. So in this case, I just assumed a rectangular prism with a uniform mass, which of course is not true. There's fuel slosh. So when you're on Earth and you have a fuel tank, say, in your car, all the fuel goes to the bottom because of gravity. But in this case, that's not true. So when you start rotating your spacecraft, the fuel will move to a different part of your tank, which will cause another attitude torque. There's error in the reaction wheel torques because I said in the beginning that you assume a constant angular momentum that the reaction wheels give to the bus, but there's always going to be error in this, whether it be physical or measurement error. There's non-rigid body dynamics. So again, in this case, I assume the moment of inertia are constant with respect to the spacecraft body, which is not true. Uh, one of the biggest sources of this is, again, the fuel slosh because the mass is moving within the spacecraft. And also, the, the, solar, the solar panels always like to flutter because they're just, if you think about a cantilever beam, it will always flutter. Whether it be small or not, it's still a non-rigid body dynamics. There's measurement uncertainty. So again, these star trackers do have uncertainty. So they need to make sure that they're within tolerance of how they're trying to measure how much mass that they actually got and whether that meets requirements. And there's also angular velocities. They are coupled in three axes. So once you introduce this attitude perturbation, the way that the spacecraft is oriented will change, say, the solar radiation pressure torque when the spacecraft is rotating. So this is a very complex thing that goes into attitude dynamics, which I'm going to get to in the spacecraft attitude control series. And there are many sources online to learn more about OSIRIS-REx, which I definitely use to get certain numbers for these. And I'll have all the links in the description because overall, this is a really cool mission and it's really exciting for what they were able to do. So if you want to learn more, definitely just check out those links. And just for a little extra, this is the first video I ever made. I didn't even intend to make it for YouTube. This is before I knew I would ever make videos, which was for a final project for my master's level class um, when I was in college. And I actually used the Osiris Rex in this example because I was doing, the project was orbital mechanics around small bodies, which is exactly what Osiris Rex is doing. So if you want to see more on that, I'll have a link in the description if you want to see kind of the analysis that goes into the orbital mechanics when the gravitational pull of the central body is so small.